Mike the Troop Jackson back with another edition of Fighters Talk. Today I'm joined by the secret weapon. First of all, first of all, love the color orange. Appreciate it. I would assume you watched last night's World Series game, correct? I did not. I was training, but uh, I got the word. You got the word? I got the word. Cool. I'm here with Pete Spratt, MMA pioneer. How do you feel about the term MMA pioneer? I mean, I'm cool with that. Pioneer, legend, old school, all the vintage words. There you I'm, go. There you I'm go. Cool <laughs> Man, I'm here with Pete Spratt today. And uh, although we're, we're in Houston, uh, you, you have a fighter coming up, uh, Richard Odoms, who will be defending his LFA title. Uh, but more importantly, next week, after roughly four years away from the sport, you return to the cage at Fury FC. What, we're at 20? Yeah. yeah 20. We're at, man, Eric Garcia, we're doing big things. We're on event number 20. But you're stepping back in the cage, man. What? Why? Well... I mean, I've been training. I've got probably 10 to 12 guys that are active fighting. So I've pretty much kind of been in camp training and the itch has gotten to me. And uh, all the guys is like, coach, you need to fight again. You need to fight again. And, you know, I was kind of throwing it out there a little bit. And then uh, I got word that somebody asked to fight me. And uh, it just kind of set the wheels in motion after that. Okay, so you, you now the the person who who asked to fight you was this? Did they know you were coming back, or is this somebody who's like, "Yo, I want to fight Pete Sprat"? I mean, I was, uh, you know, I was touching on it on Facebook. You know, uh, I saw a post. Uh, I think uh, Eric put out a post looking for fighters for San Antonio for December 9th. and uh, so I put my comment was, "How about the return of a legend?" And so I guess. Whoever saw it sent Eric a message, and you know I got one more test to complete for the commission, and once that test is done, it's on. Oh, see, and you know, it's for me at least, it's very much a nostalgic feeling to see someone uh, grow. I grew up watching, or especially when I was early in the sport, you know, uh, Pete Spratt was a dude we need to hit. You know, we need to watch and, and watch him hit somebody. Yeah, yeah. Uh, for you, what what would you say is your favorite moment, whether it be a knockout, a submission, or win, whatever? What is your favorite moment uh, over your MMA career? I mean, for me, uh, fighting-wise, um, everybody points to the L Robbie Lawler fight. But uh, my, for me personally, it was a fight that I took on 10 days' notice in Brazil. I fought Daniel Acasio, and uh, I knocked him out with a spinning back fist the last second of the last round. And uh, they actually gave me a decision win, uh, but I heard the 10-second clapper. I said, okay, I got to get him out of here because I'm not going to win in Brazil. Heard the 10-second clapper. I hit him. He fell. The bell rang. And then I, I guess they said I hit him after the bell. I don't know. But <laughs> he was clearly, if you knocked out, that's a knockout. I don't care how you look at it. Either way, that's, that's a knockout. So that, that's got to be my biggest moment. Uh, because, like I tell all my guys, you got to fight through the bell. If you don't fight through the bell, you can get caught. It's a prime example. I knocked a dude out with one second left in the fight. For me, I don't know where this ranks on, on, on your list. Um, it, it's more of a a recent, recent in relative terms, uh, 2011 in the Legacy Cage, highlight scene around the world, Antonio uh, Flora. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was, yeah, that was a good one. I, that was actually the first punch that I threw, and uh, it, it, it was, and it was a crazy thing because I remember being there, and you, it was just all footwork. You was kind of like gauge the distance, gauge the distance. And then you just threw. Actually, I just watched it not too yeah, long. Yeah, I had yeah, to go back and rewatch yeah, it because yeah, yeah. the memories only do you so much justice. Yeah. I had to go back and watch it. It was an incredible night. Do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, I remember it most definitely. And uh, just going back and looking at it, um, Chevello called it. Uh, he said he was coming in with his head up, his chin up. And, uh, you know, I saw we engaged like a couple of times and I didn't throw anything. But uh, I said, okay, next time he comes, I'm going to hit him with this check hook. And if he go to sleep, he go to sleep. And then, and I hit him, I think I hit him on the right side of his head, and he grabbed the left side of his head. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, he, but, yeah that, was, yeah, that was a great moment. That was, that was a gnarly, yeah, that was it. 
I was 41 years old. Yeah, that, and that was the other thing. You was already been aged. What, what are we now? We we can close to quit 50. 46, yeah, I'm 46. I'll be 47 in January. You're on that other side. You on that? But but okay. So we're on the other side. How would you say your training is has differed from you know obviously that's, that's I mean 10 years ago, 20 years ago, whatever. How how would you say training in general has tra uh, changed over the over your career? Well, uh, I listen to my body. Uh, I'm older. So if I if I've got some aches and pains or some issues going on, I don't I don't continue to train. I just stop, let my body heal up for that particular day or whatever the case may be, and then I pick up training the next day. I mean, it's no sense. I mean, I'm 40 46 years old. It's no sense of me trying to push through through an injury because you know at this age those injuries aren't going to heal as fast. So I don't have those recovery powers anymore. So you know I don't have a problem with okay if I need to take a day off I take a day off. Uh, you know I mean I even do that with my young guys too because you know they're not going to. I mean this sport is very demanding and uh, if your body is telling you something you probably need to listen to it. Now you know you're out in San Antonio. Uh, Solid gym. You have you have a Fury champion in Antonio. Um, you have the LFA champion, uh, heavyweight champion, and Richard Odoms. Uh, you guys, oh, CJ Vergara. You have you have a solid camp, man. What would you say it takes to to just build a, a solid team and, and stable? Because sometimes you'll get these gyms where you have. Uh, like one really good guy in the gym and everybody else is kind of mediocre and that one good guy it's hard for him to really train or get quality training but for you how would you say or how do you feel about just building up a solid gym that you have so far I mean that's the way I wanted to do it uh, I didn't want to do it like most people uh, get a lot of big names coming in uh, I wanted to build my guys from the ground up and and for the most part I've done that um, Eric Shelton is, is a guy that came in uh, a couple of years ago. He had just lost his first fight when he came to me a couple of years ago, and then he went on a four-fight winning streak. Um, but And then I got another guy, Alec, and then Antonio has been with me right at a year now. Uh, but, you know, for me, I wanted to build my foundation with my guys that nobody knew anything about and uh, build them up to show them that the process actually works. Anybody can jump up and go to Jackson's or American Top Team or any of those places, but to truly build your, your gym from the ground up and your fighters from the ground up, that's what I take great pride in. I, I dig that. Now, let's, let's talk about the fight. You, you're uh, headlining Fury FC 20 in San Antonio, uh, and, and you're taking on Washington Louise, who uh, is a striking coach over, over at, at, at Ohana. Yeah. So we know we want to see, you know, a, a, not me personally. I don't like the whole drawn out slugfest, oh, yeah, yeah. but I just like a good a, a good competitive striking match. Yeah. Is, is that what you see uh, in in the main event? I mean, I think overall my my toolbox is uh, more equipped than his. Um, he's like me probably ten years ago. Okay. Don't take this dude to the ground. Don't don't strike with this dude. And, uh, you know, I've been around a long time, and, uh, you know, my toolbox, I, I feel my toolbox is more complete. And, uh, you know, if it's an entertaining matchup on the feet, uh, and it, say, say he happens to start getting the best of me on the feet, then I can always go into the clinch. I can always dump him and take him to the ground. So, you know, my overall game, I think, is better than his. And uh, so, I mean, it should be an interesting contest. I mean, after all, it is mixed martial arts. You're right. What what threats do you feel that uh, he presents? I know you said that he's like you ten years ago, but he, I, I mean, it's a fight. You know, he he has to he has to possess some type of threat to you. What do you feel those are, if if, if any? He uh, got nothing. I mean, he just you ten years ago. Uh, I mean, like, like you said, it's a fight. Um, you know, uh, my, my heavyweight, Richard Odoms, he used to go over there and spar until uh, they found out that. So here's my deal. If you welcome a guy from another gym to your gym, and then you tell a guy he can't come back because you train at that other gym just because you're fighting a guy from that gym, I'm not cool with that. So. It, if there was an issue with him training with me to begin with, you should have never opened the, opened your doors to him to begin with. And so, you know, when they found out that this fight was potentially going to go down, uh, they told, oh, he couldn't come back. So, well, he shouldn't have been over there to begin with. 
if you feel that way. Right. I mean, Luis is a, a 70 pounder. Big O going over there and getting work with the heavyweights has nothing to do with him. I mean, it's not like I've been around the game almost 20 years, so it ain't nothing y'all doing over there that I ain't never seen before. So, well, well, one year, and that that makes perfect sense. That, you know, you you have a heavyweight coming over here getting his work with other heavyweights. This guy, he he's not over here trying to get work with heavyweights, and then he's peeking over here to see yeah. what this yeah. welterweight's doing. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah. Why, why? I mean, why do you feel? I mean, because that's a, that, that's not just over there. I mean, I, I've seen it at all types of gyms. Yeah. Like, what it, what is it about that that makes a, a gym do that? I, I mean, I don't know. I mean, unless he was over there, going over there, actually going to training sessions and classes, uh, game planning, uh, working his working his overall MMA game. Now that's different. Right. Well, of course. That's different. If you if you're working on your camp, that's different. But if you're just showing up to go over there and spar on a Saturday, it shouldn't make a difference. I mean, are you showing all your toolboxes on that one day? <laughs> I'm not. Uh, when I spar, I have a I have a certain things that I work on on each sparring session. I have a set criteria of what I'm going to work on that, on that particular day, and it may it may go round by round because I'll, I'll change everything up as I'm training. One round I might hit you with straight hands. Next round, I might focus on going more traditional Thai style. Next round, I'll probably go a little bit, throw a little bit of the point karate and the spinning techniques into it. So I'm always, I'm always playing with stuff to see if it works in sparring, because if I can actually apply it in the sparring session, then I know I can train my guys that, okay, this is going to work for you because I hit such and such with it last week. Well, I mean, it, it seems that's actually the, the objective of sparring. Like, you're not going in to knock your, your sparring partner out. At least from an MMA perspective, I know on, let's say, the boxing side, mm -hmm. you kind of get that a little bit differently. But for MMA, I, it was funny, I was having this conversation yesterday. But as far as MMA goes, you're not looking to go knock someone out. So I don't understand why people aren't using it as a learning tool yeah. as opposed to uh, let me style on somebody. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, I am sparring. I'm, we spar once a week. So for me... In my gym, we have a fight every week, and that fight is on Saturday. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. Yeah. I, I, I'm not saying that you need to go like 20, you know, oh, yeah, something like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You need, you need to have that, yeah. you know, at, at certain levels. You need to have it where you have to pick up the pace. You have to go 70, 80 yeah. percent. But again, you're not trying. Like I'm not going. In, I'm gonna knock you. You know, some guys go out there knocking. They're trying to finish you oh, yeah, and spar. Yeah. Like we're not trying to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, I mean, there's some days we have we have to do that because we spar once a week. And then there's some days that I'm just working on stuff. Okay. What can I what can I do? Let me try some new techniques during the sparring session. But at the same time, I'm still going pretty hard on the guys, and uh, so so I know that it works under an actual firefight. Um, but yeah, man, I mean, you know, for the most part, man, the sparring sessions for us, they are hard sparring sessions. But at the same time, we're gathering information. Right. We're gathering information. Over the course of your career, obviously you've been, you, you've been able to train at you know different gyms and all across the world. What what would you say is one thing that you've picked up that could be useful for this newer generation or newer crop of fighters coming up? Something that maybe you, you learned you know years ago. Like I like to I like to tell CJ when you come into the when you come into a fight, bring your box of cereal. He's like, what, what, what you talking about, coach? In particular, one brand, Trix. <laughs> Bring your tricks to the fight because you can set, you can con condition a response and set people up to ultimately hit them with a trick. Okay. And so, and, and for me, with this newer generation, man, you know, everybody's so good at everything. So now, every, with everybody being on the same level, you have to have some tricks that's going to okay. put you over the top. All right. There you have it. This is my Uncle Pete. He's giving, the, he's dropping in some knowledge. He's been a How long? How long have you been in the sport? I see. I had my first fight, '98, so it's fixing to be 20 years. Look at that, <laughs> man! It's coming up on, on 20 years, and, and you're about to have. Will this be your final fight? Or what do we even know? Well, uh, there's a potential that I could be possibly fighting for LFA. So um, we'll see how this fight goes with Fury. We'll see how my body feels and. Uh, then me and Colin will have a conversation, and you know you might see me return one more time. You know, under the under the bright lights of the TV set. Man, I, it, it's gonna be dope right here, Uncle Pete. 
He's uh, stepping into the Furio CK December 9th, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, if you're in the city, you can get all your Fury tickets at mythetruth.com slash tickets. If you can't make it out, uh, the fights will be streamed live at flowcombat.com. Pete, anybody else you want to give a shout-out to or anybody you want to give a shout-out to before we get out of here? Well, let me give a shout-out to my wife. She might get mad if I don't. My daughter, Arian. And then uh, my team, man, over at uh, Peace Spread Muay Thai and Rodrigo Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, man, I got, I got a great team behind me. All my fighters, hey, man, let's do this. Uncle Pete, 